We welcome all of you here, and uh, I think we can begin. Uh, as we get ready to once again look in the Word of the Lord, uh, I remind my heart and yours of that indispensable principle, total reliance on God's Holy Spirit. The Bible is God's book. He wrote it, and He alone can illuminate. it. Only God can reveal God. Uh, I want to share this verse before we go to prayer. It's from Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 25. And it's actually the literal translation, and it's in the margin of a New American Standard. And here's what it says. The righteous eats to the satisfaction of his soul. And I just think that's a beautiful uh, invitation not to go away hungry. The righteous eats to the satisfaction of his soul. The more we eat in the physical, the greater our capacity becomes. And that's also true in the spiritual. Where was that, Brother Ed? That's in Proverbs 13, verse 25. And, and the reference I had was to the marginal reference in the New American Standard. All right, let's pray together. <clears throat> Our Father, we thank you this morning that we can gather again in your name, trust the indwelling Holy Spirit to turn our eyes to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that we all might eat to the satisfaction of our soul. And you are the staple of life. You're the bread of life, the water of life. Enable us to feed on you in a special way. Thank you again for all of your word. And as we continue our look at uh, the importance of coming with your heart to this matter of signs, we ask for your guidance in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> all right, we're... Uh, in our discussion, it, it, those of you that were here, uh, remember, we're in our discussion, sort of a parenthesis in our study of Judges, uh, about spiritual signs. And that was suggested because of Judges chapter 6, 36 to 40, uh, Gideon's Fleece. Let me just read that passage. <clears throat> uh, verse 36, Gideon said to God, if you will deliver Israel through me, as you have spoken, behold, I will put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there's dew on the fleece only, and it's dry on the ground, I will know that you will deliver Israel through me, as you have spoken. And it was so. <clears throat> when he arose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece, he drained the fleece do from the fleece a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, Do not let your anger burn against me, that I may speak once more. Please let me make a test once more with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece, and let there be dew on all the ground. And God did so that night. It was dry only on the fleece, and the dew was all on the ground. Because of this story, Gideon and the fleas, a teaching has really swept through the body of Christ, through the church of God, called fleecing. Uh, some people call it just putting out a fleece. In other words, <clears throat> in order to discover the will of God, or in order to confirm what they believe to be the will of God, uh, they seek a supernatural sign from God because they don't want to miss God's will. They don't want to make a mistake. And so they do what Gideon did. They put out a fleece to verify or to seal the will of God. Put a stamp on this. I don't want to miss your will. And because we know the heart is very deceitful, and because we know there's an enemy that would seek to lead us away from the will of God, there are some Christians with a passion to be dead certain 
They don't want to make a mistake. And so they asked God, like Gideon did, for a special sign so that they might know for sure they're in the will of God. It might be a simple sign. Some people, uh, I've heard of people, just you know, if the phone rings in the next five minutes, I'll know that it's your will. Or uh, I've got to deal with this situation. If they bring it up, then I'll know it's your will. Or if I get a better offer, then I know it's your will. If you send a buyer to, for this house or this car, then I'll know it's your will, and so on. They could be simple like that, or they could be dramatic. If I get a call from a foreign nation, from somebody I've never heard before, and that kind of thing. Now, I did that one time. I mean, I didn't do it. I, I received. I received a call. I received a call, and they said, is this Ed Miller? Yes, this is Ed Miller. Don't go to Brazil. If you go to Brazil, you're going to be invited to Brazil. If you go, you will die. And then they hung up. And so I told Lillian, we're not going to Brazil. <laughs> I never did get an invitation to Brazil. Anyway... <laughs> Uh, I know a sister, here's an illustration, in Rhode Island. This is a true story, a little bit sad. But she wanted so much to see God, I mean see with these eyes, not these. She wanted to see God do a miracle. And so what she did was she took all of the clothes that her little children had and she burned them. And because she wanted, she said, God won't let my kids down. Uh, I know he, he won't do it for me, but he won't let the kids down. And then I can see God supernaturally work a miracle. Well, at the time, I was pastoring a little church up there, and she called me. And she asked me to come over to her house. So I took a, a, a brother, because I don't visit women by myself, and so I took a brother, we went over to the house, and she had all these little kids running around naked. Oh, and so we asked, why are they naked? And she told the story. I want to see a miracle of God. Well, I suppose we were the answer to her prayer, because the church is not going to allow those children to go with no clothes, and so uh, our church provided, but... Uh, that kind of thing is rampant. God's people are so determined. I want visible evidence that God is alive, moving, working, and I want to know his will. And so they have used Gideon and fleecing. Now, I ask you to be patient with me, please, as I go through this parenthesis, uh, because in my own life, I have been... a rather burned by this idea of putting out a fleece. And I know Christians who have been burned by this idea. And that's why I want to share principles that have helped me through the years. Now, I've known the Lord Jesus for 60 years. And I'm not saying that in every moment I was walking in an unbroken union with him. But through the years, I've learned some wonderful truths of God. And as I go through this, it may seem like I'm a little off the subject, so I ask you to be patient. I don't want to ramble, but I want to illustrate it enough ways so I can communicate my heart and unload this passion that I have, that we have God's heart concerning this issue. So last week, I introduced what I'm calling three guiding principles, very foundational principles, uh, and three guiding principles uh, to help us uh, navigate this, these currents uh, so that we get God's heart on the subject. Now last week we looked at the first principle. The first principle, I'll state it again, uh, God always deals with us as we are, and where we are, in order to bring us to the place that he desires us to be. In other words, uh, Psalm 139 and verse 3, You scrutinize my path, 
my lying down, you are intimately acquainted with all my ways. God knows each of us intimately. With all our ways, he's intimately acquainted. And he knows what we need. You are you and I am me. And uh, we are different. Our personalities may be different. Our temperaments may be different. Certainly our experiences are different. Uh, even our depth in the knowledge of God may be different. Our hungers, our desires might be different. Our capacities are different. The influences in our life, everything's different. And God knows each of us individually. And he has promised to meet us where we are, as we are, to bring us where he wants us to be. And the reason I gave that as a principle is because he knows us so well. He knows if we need a sign to go forward. And if we need it, he'll provide it. He knows our needs. And whatever we need to go forward, he is going to meet us there. Now, as we closed last time, I was illustrating that truth, that God knows what we need. Sometimes we think we need this. Lord, I'm not going on if you don't give me this. I told you in my own life, uh, Lord, I need to know you're there. Blink the lights. And I couldn't go on if he didn't blink the lights. Well, it's been 60 years. I went on. He didn't blink the lights for me. Uh, and I gave the illustration last time that I was told the indispensable sign of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. Well, I don't want to miss an indispensable sign. I want to know I'm filled with the Spirit. And I went after that so much. I wept. I sought it. I begged. I fasted. And I told you the story. I really thought my Christian life was over if I didn't get that blessing. Well, I didn't get that blessing. Others around me claim they got it, but I never got it. So guess what I did? I went on without it. <laughs> the whole point is I didn't need it. I thought I did. But God knows what I need. I guarantee if I had needed that emotional experience to have the sense of his presence, he would have given it to me. He always meets us as we are, where we are, in order to bring us where we ought to be. Uh, I don't know my own needs. I may think I need money, or I may need transportation, or I may need shelter, or something like that. Uh, it's been about 30 years now since I have asked God for anything physical. I don't ask God for anything physical. Uh, and here's the verse that changed me on that. 1 Peter 1.6 In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while... If necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. Uh, when I first read that verse, it was in the King James. And it didn't say, if necessary. King James says, if need be. I was asking God to meet my needs. <laughs> if need be, you are in uh, various trials and affliction. And so when I asked him to meet my needs, I was a little surprised uh, when I he got affliction. In this connection, I love Isaiah 30, verse 20 and 21. Although the Lord has given you the bread of privation and the water of oppression, he, your teacher, will no longer hide himself. Your eyes will behold your teacher Your ears will hear a word behind you. This is the way. Walk in it whenever you turn to the right or to the left. King James again says that he feeds us with the bread of affliction. And Lillian and I were praying, give us this day our daily bread. I wasn't expecting the bread of affliction, <laughs> but that's daily bread. And I don't know what I need. I have a hard time because a lot of Christians love us and they often ask, what are your needs? Do you have any needs that we want to pray for you? 
And I always have trouble with that because of Psalm 23.1. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack $350 a month. And that's not what it says. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd. I need a new car. Mine broke down. The Lord is my shepherd. I need a new roof on my house. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And I'm not trying to push it on you or anybody else, but the way Lillian and I approach these things, if I don't have it, I don't need it. He will provide all of our needs. Matthew 6, 31. Do not worry then, saying, What shall we eat? Or, What shall we drink? Or, What shall we wear for clothing? The Gentiles seek all those things. Your heavenly Father knows you have need of those things. He knows, and He's going to provide our needs. Uh, let me try to give this illustration before I leave this point uh, from the life of Gideon, since that's who we're studying. You know, Gideon needed assurance. Uh, God had called him to be the instrument of blessing, and he wanted to make dead sure he got that right. Are you serious, Lord? You're choosing me. I need to know. And to get that assurance and to drive out the doubt and the fear from his heart, he asked God for a convincing sign. And that is the fleece. The wet fleece, the dry ground, the dry fleece, the wet ground. And God responded. God gave him that sign. He gave him the 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 wet fleece and the dry ground, the dry fleece and the wet ground. But now here's my question. After a miraculous sign like that, and that was miraculous, that God did that, wouldn't you think that he'd be absolutely convinced? Now I know for sure. I don't have any doubt. I don't have any fear. God has given me the sign I requested of him. Listen to Judges 7, 9 and 10. The same night it came about, the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp. I've given it into your hand. But if you're afraid to go down, go with Pura, your servant, down to the camp. Here's Gideon. After that miraculous sign, he dictated to the Lord, and he's still fearful. He's still afraid. Now, God knew... Gideon did need a sign. And uh, he was convinced that the sign that he asked God to give him wouldn't be enough to convince him. So God gave him a sign he never asked for. That's a precious thing. Judges 7.13, When Gideon came, behold, a man was relating a dream to his friend. And he said, Behold, I had a dream. A loaf of barley bread was tumbling into the camp of Midian. It came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned it upside down so the tent lay flat. Now here's a sign. A tumbling barley cake. A rolling cupcake down the hill. And it comes because an unsaved person had a dream. And that dream was interpreted by another unsaved person. Dreams are made out of air. <laughs> Dreams are woven together in your imagination. Things you picked up from here and there and everywhere. It's fantasy in many, many cases. It, it, many times it's absurd. Uh, I've had some of the weirdest dreams in the world. <laughs> One of my dreams, I gave Lily a hard time. Because we, I, I, we were driving along in my dream, we had a flat tire. And I said, what are we going to do? We have a flat tire. She took an eraser off the pencil. She said, this is rubber, let's put that on for a tire. That was my dream. So I woke up and I said, Lillian, how dumb could you be? <laughs> and she's blaming me. In my dream, I thought that was a stupid idea. <laughs> so I don't know if it was her idea or mine. The whole point is, here is a dream, a bizarre dream, a cupcake rolling down the hill, wiping out 135,000 of the enemy. 
it's interpreted, this is the sword of the Lord, the sword of Gideon. Listen to 7.15. When Gideon heard the account of the dream and its interpretation, he bowed in worship. He returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, the Lord has given the camp of Midian into your hand. The sign he dictated to the Lord did not give him full assurance. The sign God gave to him, a cupcake rolling down a hill, interpreted by an unsaved man, he said, oh, now I have peace. If you need it, you'll get it. And God knows what you need. He needed that sign. Uh, Judges, once again, 7.15, when Gideon heard the account of the dream and its interpretation, he bowed in worship, returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, the Lord has given the camp into your hands. So, once again, summarizing that principle, if you need a sign, God knows you. He'll deal with you as you are, where you are, to bring you to the place that he wants us to. To be. That's the first guiding principle to help us navigate through this, these rapids of differing ideas. Now as I present this, uh, I, I confess, it's not a confession, I admit, I acknowledge, that's the better word, that there are godly men and godly women who see this differently. And I am not in any way trying to uh, debate or, or argue against godly men. The reason I call these rapids is because there's many, many stones <laughs> in this thing. And uh, uh, we could get hurt. Some have been shipwrecked because of these stones. Uh, Lillian and I one time in Tennessee went on one of these rough uh, water rapid you know, in a rubber boat. Uh, our water wasn't all that rough because it hadn't rained in a while. And, uh, but it was rough enough to know that you needed somebody guiding that thing and navigating that thing to get you around the rocks and the currents and so on. And there was a couple that had, in their boat, they had capsized, turned over, and they're uh, wading to shore and so on. Uh, but for that reason, I want to give you these guiding principles because there are several sharp rocks. Anyway, <clears throat> let me give you the second principle. Not only does God always deal with us as and where we are to bring us to the place that he would have us, but the second principle can be expressed in these words. It is always scriptural to ask the Lord for clear guidance. I didn't say ask the Lord for a sign. I said it's always scriptural to ask the Lord for clear guidance. Now that might include signs. It might not. But it's always scriptural. Psalm 27, 11. I've almost worn that passage out in my life. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a level path because of my foes. King James, lead me in a plain path because of my enemies. And it's not only my enemies out there, but it's my enemies in here. And I just say, Lord, lead me in a plain path because of my enemies. Uh, once again, that's not the same as saying, Lord, give me a sign. It's saying, give me a plain path. And the Lord knows if you'll need a sign. Uh, he may give it, he may not. Many, many books. You can see how this whole idea of signs is tied in with the will of God. And there are many books written on how to know the will of God. One of my favorite was written by F.B. Meyer in uh, uh, 1896. It's called The Secret of Guidance. Perhaps you've heard of the Harbor Illustration. The harbor illustration, the harbor in the illustration is in Italy someplace. Uh, there was a narrow channel. Uh, to get to the harbor, you had to go through this narrow channel. And that waterway was known because of its huge, sharp rocks. And if you didn't know how to, where the deep water was, uh, you could have a lot of trouble. Uh, many ships, they say, had been shipwrecked trying to get to that harbor. Uh, the deep part of the harbor, uh, they put up three poles. 
And on each pole, they put a red light. And the rule was that the captain of the ship, or whoever's driving the craft, uh, had to look at those lights, those poles. And they had to line the ship up so that the lights would line up. And when the three lights became one light, <laughs> they would follow it into the harbor and they would be safe. That was the idea. And the illustration is, those three lights, the Word of God is one light. It's got to have the Word of God. Peace in your heart by the Holy Spirit. That's the second light. And the third light, circumstances by the providence of God. And so when you have the Word of God and the peace of God in your heart and circumstances line up, they say that is a safe way to get into the harbor. That is how to find the will of God. It sounds good, <laughs> but the method is not infallible. In fact, I don't think it's even safe. So let me, <laughs> once again, let me vent my own heart. Because of the issue, the will of God, it's, yes? You just should share Buzz's uh, thing about guidance because that fits so perfectly. But that's not in my notes. <laughs> <laughs> we had a. De I'll, I'm going to tell the story that that she tells. It's it's really a beautiful story. I had a dear brother. Uh, I met him because he was in the navy. We had a navy church, and uh, he left Rhode Island and he w moved to Texas. He got out of the navy and he moved to Texas. And he took some steps away from the Lord. And uh, he decided he was going to come back to the Lord. And he wanted to come back to Rhode Island uh, where we could have some fellowship. And he told me he's going to get right with the Lord. He's coming back to the Lord. And so in order to do that, he bought a bunch of books. I am going to find my way back. And he had a whole stack of books. And on the way, he wanted to drive around and stop in South Carolina, visit a friend of ours. Uh, some of you might know him, Bob Johnson. He wanted to visit a friend of ours. And then from there, he's going to come up to Rhode Island. And so he comes in with all his books at Bob Johnson's, and he puts them on the table. And he's very emotional. And so he's really wanting to get into the will of God. And... He says to Bob, uh, Bob said, what are the books for? He said, I'm going to find the will of God. And uh, then he said to Bob, where should I start? And he says, I don't know. What book is on the top? And he said, Nave's Topical Bible. He said, I'd start there. <laughs> and so he said, what should I look up? <laughs> he said, I don't know, look up guidance. So he looked up guidance. Nave's Topical Bible. And you know what it said? See God. See God. That was the end of it. He got rid of all the books. He was right with the Lord. And he turned himself back to the Lord. That was Lillian's illustration. <clears throat> the point is, because it's the will of God, eventually, and we're going to touch that today, God helping us, eventually we're going to have to know how can I distinguish between the voice of the Holy Spirit, the voice of the human spirit, and the voice of the evil spirit? You understand that has to be important, right? All right. Now, take circumstances, for example. Uh, just because circumstances are favorable... The time seems right, the finances seem right, there seems to be agreement in all the parties and so on. Uh, we can't trust our own natural heart. We might want our will and just want God's stamp of approval on our own particular will. And there's evidence that Satan can control circumstances to lead someone away from the will of God. Uh, now we know for certain Jonah was running away from the will of God. We know that. Jonah 1, 3. Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. 
He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish, paid the fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now, he could have reasoned. Look at the circumstances. This must be God's will. The ship hasn't left yet. It's down there. I have enough money to pay the fare. That's perfect. It's going where I want to go. It's going to Tarsus. Praise the Lord, he's guided me. <laughs> Except we know he's running from the will of God. Uh, we must never, brothers and sisters in Christ, take God's favor or displeasure and say circumstances show that he's either happy or sad with us. Not necessarily so. Job's friends looked at Job's circumstances and then they said, God is angry with you. And we know the story of Job. That's not the story at all. Job chapter 4, verse 7. This is Eliphaz the Temanite. Remember now, whoever perished being innocent, where were the upright destroyed? According to what I've seen, those who plow iniquity, those who trouble or sow trouble, harvest it. In other words, Job, the reason you're going through this is circumstances prove it. You're sinful and God's angry at you. That's how he read it. Zophar had the same idea, but the other way around. He said, if you were living right, things would be right. Job 11, 14. If iniquity's in your hand, put it far away. Do not let wickedness dwell in your tents. Then verse 16. You would forget your trouble as waters that have passed by. You'd remember it. Your life would be brighter than noonday. Darkness would be like the morning. You would trust because there's hope. You would look around and rest securely. You would lie down. None would disturb you. Many would entreat your favor. If your circumstances are good, God's happy. If they're bad, God's upset with you. Job 22, the words of Eliphaz, verse 4. Is it because of your reverence? that he reproves you, that he enters into judgment with you? Is not your wickedness great and your iniquities without end? Circumstances are a poor guiding light. Suffering, affliction, is not necessarily a sign of God's disapproval. And blessing is not necessarily a sign of his approval. He reigns on the just and on the unjust. And so you can't look at a blessing and say, God's happy with him. Or uh, bad circumstances, say God's angry. And yet, according to the principle, you can always trust God for clear guidance. Ask the Lord to make it clear. Not necessarily ask for a sign, just make it clear God knows if you'll need a sign. I come back to the question, how do I distinguish between the voice of the Holy Spirit, human spirit, and evil spirit? I'll get to that, but a verse that has greatly helped me is Philippians 3.15. This is another one that I like to wear out. Philippians 3.15, Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. Now this attitude in the context is Philippians 2.5. Let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ. If, uh, again to 15. As many as are perfect have this attitude. If in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that to you. Isn't that a tremendous truth? How do I know if I have the mind of Christ? As you go on in your Christian life, how do you distinguish the difference between the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the nagging of Satan? Let me make a suggestion. The Holy Spirit is always specific. The Holy Spirit 
always says, thou art the man. He puts his finger on it. He stirs up your spirit control conscience and you know exactly what is grieving him and, and causing him uh, to, to have a problem with you. On the other hand, the nagging of the, of the enemy is general. He just wants you to live in a spirit of condemnation. Uh, Satan wants you discouraged. He does not want you to enjoy the joy of the Lord. But it's general. Somebody will look at you and say, what's wrong? Say, I don't know. I just feel terrible. Well, what is it exactly? Uh, I don't know. It's just gloomy. It's one of those days. I just feel bad. It's just nothing to confess to the Lord. Nothing specific. Just a general heaviness of spirit in that condition and it comes to me in that condition I claim Philippians 3 15 I said Lord you promised if in anything I'm otherwise minded you'd make it known if there's anything make it known and if he doesn't make it known I leave it with Satan. You take it. I'm going on and rejoice in the Lord. I'm going to be like Spurgeon. They asked him, do you ever get into the dumps? Do you ever go down the valley? He said, yes, but I've learned to carry my mountains with me. <laughs> exactly so. You go down, but you don't lose the joy of the Lord. Don't let Satan nag you. If in anything you're otherwise minded, Ask, and God will make it clear. If he doesn't, go on and enjoy the Lord. Uh, let me mention one way the Lord re reveals his mind. This becomes very essential. Uh, Psalm 37, 4, it's one of these memory verses, a plaque verse. You put it on the wall. But I'll tell you, the truth of God here is tremendous. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Delight in the Lord, that's your part, and He'll give you the desires of the heart. He's not saying He'll give you everything your heart desires. That's not what He's saying. But the desires that you have, where did they come from? He gives you the desires of your heart. Uh, let me illustrate. There are two options. Option A, option B. I want to know which is the will of God. Shall I have A or B? One thing I can do is say, Lord, please, let me know. Make it clear. If A is your will, tell me. If B is your will, tell me. I need to know. If I need a sign, give me a sign. Somehow, I need to know, is it A or is it B? That's one way to discover it. Here's the second way. <laughs> Lord, here's option A, here's option B. I think I'll do A. He gave me the desire of my heart. I desire A, <laughs> so I'm going to do it. Now that might not seem so miraculous, but I'll tell you, if you delight in the Lord, He's given you the desires, and it's easy to live the Christian life because you're you. Just do what you're supposed to do. And you have A and B, I think I'll do B. I'll tell you, that's a precious, precious principle following the desires that He's planted in your heart because you're delighting in Jesus. Uh, if I was hungry, had a strong desire, I'll tell you, I'd know what food would look like. And if I was thirsty and had a strong desire, I'd know what water looked like. And if my heart is set on Christ, if I want to honor Him and please Him and do His will, I'm going to know what it looks like. And I'm going to choose that because He has put it in my heart. When I see Christ in the Word... I start to think like he did. That's called renewing of the mind. And I start to love what he loves. <laughs> I start to choose what he would choose, the will of God. Proverbs 3, 6, In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct 
your paths. That's a great key to walking in the will of God. Just delight in the Lord. Just acknowledge the Lord and He's going to guide you. I'll tell you how to miss the will of God. I should be telling you how to find it, but I'll tell you how to miss it. Here's how to miss the will of God. Chase after the will of God. If you chase after the will of God, you're going to miss the will of God. It's off-center. You're to go after the God whose will it is. Not after the will of God, but the God whose will it is. The key to guidance is the guide. The Lord's my shepherd. He leadeth me. It's going, you can't miss the path if you have the guide. And so run after the guide. Uh, a lot of times we get a lot of calls and so on from young people. Uh, how do I know the right location? Where am I supposed to live? How do I know the right vocation? What am I supposed to do? How do I know my life partner? Who am I supposed to choose? How do I know the right ministry? How can I find the will of God? My answer, delight in the Lord. <laughs> Seek the Lord. You're done. <laughs> Try that for 80 years. If it doesn't work, <laughs> because I'll tell you, at the end of 80 years, you look back and you'll see all the guidance you ever want to see. If you focus on the Lord and not on the will of God. I love this benediction of Paul, 2 Corinthians, rather, 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 16. Before I read that, let me turn this over. <clears throat> Uh, now the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace in every circumstance. The Lord of peace will give you peace. You're looking to Christ. You have peace in every circumstance. Colossians 3.15 Let the peace of God rule your heart to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. The peace of God rules the heart at all times, in all circumstances. Uh, recently, I received an invitation to minister in a certain place. And in their invitation letter, they said, don't say yes. Ask God to give you peace concerning this invitation. And then when you have peace, let me know. Well, that terribly confused me. And I'll tell you why it confused me, because I live in peace. I'm in peace right now with the Lord. I already have peace that passes understanding. And now they're saying, ask him for peace. Am I going to get peace on peace? I didn't understand that at all. I wrote and I told them my, my dilemma. Uh, one day someone asked Hudson Taylor, do you know when you are abiding in Jesus? I love his answer. Uh, he said, about a week ago, uh, I joined a dear brother in some rich Christian fellowship. And I was at his home. And as we were at his home, the fellowship got so sweet, the time passed away. And pretty soon, it was very late in the night. And that friend asked me if I wouldn't stay with him, spend the night at his house, and then I could travel in the daylight. And I took him at his offer, and I stayed with him. Now, it was a joy for me to fellowship with him and abide in his presence in his house. Now, you ask me, do I know when I'm abiding in Christ? Here's my answer. I don't remember a single hour or a single moment when I was not abiding in the house of my friend. You follow what he was saying? He was saying, I may not know when I'm abiding in Christ, but I know when I'm not. I know when I'm not abiding in Christ. Let the peace of God rule your heart. Uh, Colossians 3.15 uh, We live in peace. We walk in peace. We have peace in every circumstance. And if, that, if there's absence of peace, then uh, I would really 
search out the Lord and walk softly. So that's the second safeguard. We can ask God for clear guidance. It's not complicated. As we delight in Him, He conforms us to the image of Christ, planting desires in our heart. And then we just follow those desires. I want to give the final answer to this question. How can I distinguish between the voice of the Holy Spirit, the voice of the human spirit, and the voice of the evil spirit? Here's the answer. I can't. I'm serious. I can't. And I don't worry about it. You don't need to worry about it. That's a distraction. God hasn't called you to distinguish between those voices. That'll frustrate you to death, and you'll spend all your time trying to distinguish between the voice of the evil spirit, Holy Spirit, and human spirit. The voice of the evil spirit is too deceptive. The voice of the human spirit is too subjective, and... The voice of the Holy Spirit is influenced by the voice of the evil spirit and the voice of the human spirit. When I am abiding in Christ, when I'm delighting in Christ, when I'm looking to Jesus, when I'm appropriating His life, He transforms my thinking so I think His thoughts. He transforms my desires so I want His will. I want to honor Him. And so I just, uh, once again, I just go on in the Lord. I don't need to try to figure those things out. Uh, aren't you glad for a verse like John 14, 26? The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he'll teach you all things. Bring to your remembrance all I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. And then chapter 16, verse 13. When he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He'll not speak on his own initiative. Whatever he hears, he'll speak. He'll disclose to you what is to come. He'll glorify me. He'll take of mine and disclose it unto you. You have the Holy Spirit. Principle number one, he'll deal with you exactly where you are. He knows what you need. Principle number two, trust him. Trust Him to guide you. He said He's going to do it. He's given you His Holy Spirit. He's promised to guide you. He'll guide you with His eye upon you. Let me quickly give that third principle, and then next week or next session, we can go back to Gideon. Uh, the third principle can be stated in these words. <clears throat> God's voice is the Bible. That's God's voice. Psalm 119, 105, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The reason I was so concerned about this whole issue, because I got terribly burned by it, what is the essential evil in asking God for a sign? And the answer is 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We walk by faith, not by sight. Signs are sight. It's the opposite of faith. And how, you say, how does faith come? Well, Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing. And hearing concerning the word of Christ. Remember Thomas, John chapter 20, 25. Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said, Unless I see in his hand the imprint of the nails, put my finger in the place of the nails, put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Thomas said, I need empirical evidence. I need to see it. I need a sign. And the Lord Jesus met that. 
John 20, 26, after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger. See my hands? Reach here with your hand. Put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas, who was seeking a sign, was called by the Lord Jesus an unbelieving believer. There are unbelieving unbelievers, but there are also unbelieving believers. And Thomas was one of them. And then the Lord showed him something that no sign could ever reveal. It had to be by the Holy Spirit from heaven in his heart. And he said, my Lord and my God. No sign could say, my Lord. No sign could show the deity of Christ. That was a revelation to his heart. John 20, 29. Because you've seen me, Jesus said, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believe. Faith has no need for signs. If you need it, God will give it to you. But if you're trusting in the Lord, I love the way John uh, follows up that sign story in verses 30, 31. Many other signs Jesus performed in the presence of the disciples, not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that believing you may have life in his name. These signs have been written so you believe. Every sign you ever need is in this book. That's all you'll ever need. It's in this book. These are written so that you believe that Jesus is the Christ believing you might have life in his name. Uh, that's a precious, precious truth. And so uh, signs are sight. And it's not faith. It, it actually is weak faith or an indication of no faith. Uh, a lot of people that I've known who sought signs, and I was one of them, uh, they were lazy spiritually. You know, it's a lot easier to sit in a recliner and wait for the mailman than to seek God and seriousness and to go after the, the heart of God. It's a lot easier to just sit back and wait for the phone to ring or wait for somebody to come in and, or someone to uh, give you some kind of a miracle and so on. Let me explain as I close once more why I took the time to share those three principles. He deals with us where we are. You can always claim clear guidance and he calls us to live by faith as we trust the revelation of Christ in this book. I wanted to share those wonderful truths because I believe the enemy of your heart and mine, I believe Satan, wants you to believe that it's difficult to find the will of God. Books are written on how to find the will of God. It is not difficult. In fact, it's the exact opposite of that. It's the simplest thing in all the world. But everybody seems to make an issue. you got to know the will of God and so on. The Lord, it's almost as if they, they say the Lord wants you to struggle and wonder always, is this God's will? Is that God's will? The Christian life is not living on eggshells. The Christian life is, is not always wondering and always concerned, uh, always frightened. Oh, I hope I'm not missing God's will. We had another sister that Lillian and I know. She went crazy over the will of God. She should have been institutionalized because she said in the morning, Lord, I want your will. Do you want me to go shopping today? Which store? Which route to get to that store? She seriously prayed about that. Which aisle do you want me to go down first? Which brand do you want me to buy? She was going crazy because her heart was, I just want the will of God. That is not necessary. Here's your part, and may God help us. Principle number one, he knows all about you. 
He deals with you where you are, as you are, to bring you to the place you ought to be. What's your part? Say thank you. Uh. I'm serious. That's your part. Say thank you. Here's the second principle. He has determined to make his will certain and to guide you every step along the way. I love what Fanny Crosby wrote there. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Nothing. He'll lead you all the way. What's your part? Trust Him. Trust Him. Thank Him. Trust Him. And finally, He's given us the Holy Spirit to reveal Christ in this book. When we see Christ, we're transformed. And so I start to think like Him. And I start to desire like Him. What's my part? Seek Christ. This whole matter of sign seeking. Say thank you. Trust the Lord. Seek the Lord. And you'll never miss the will of God. Well, Lord willing, in our next session, we'll get back to Gideon. I hope that helped. Anyway, any comments or questions? Yes. Yes. <laughs> quite a bit and had all these before computers and all these listed airplanes and so I was praying and saying Lord which one of these airplanes would be safe for me to travel on he said the one you're on I said oh wow and I took away all fear of airplanes yeah how about that <laughs> he always meets us where we are Bill Brother Ed, can, you, can you kind of explain this you know in Acts uh, Paul and some of them felt that the Lord was calling them to go one place, and he said, the Spirit's leading us here. And then another group said, the Spirit's leading us here. And then they saw the man, Macedonia says, come over here. I... Well, I just think that's the thing. They desired to go north. God closed the door. Yeah. Then they decided to go south. God closed the door. Then they got a dream of the man from Macedonia, and the man from Macedonia ended up to be a woman. <laughs> it was Lydia. <laughs> And, and, yeah, that's just he's going to guide you you can't miss it okay. he just opens doors closes doors and all it's amazing now Lillian and I in our life we have done nothing but bounce off walls we have no clue you know I, I would love I always say the guide's in front of you but that verse I quoted earlier you'll hear a voice behind you saying this is the way walk in it I wish he was out in front. He got him behind. Boom. Not that way. Boom. Not that way. But we look back in our lives and oh my, we can't praise the Lord enough for the guidance we had. And so you don't need to worry. Just go after the Lord and you're not going to miss the will of God. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you that you know us and will always meet us where we are. We thank you that you have given your great promise that you would always be with us and guide us and, and lead us and take us forward into your life and all the truth. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit who constantly shows us Christ, renews our mind, and puts desires in our heart so that we can walk in your ways and honor you. Oh, Lord, make these things real in our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.